Good afternoon, everyone. This is Vicki Harrell. I'm the Executive Director of QATC, the Quality Assurance and Training Connection. We're a partner with CRM Exchange for this great virtual conference that I hope you are enjoying this week. I'd like to welcome you to the 2015 QA and Analytics Virtual Conference. And we're so excited to have a great lineup of, of webinars today, and we're going to have today some great speakers from VPI talking to us about the top 10 workforce optimization best practices. There are a few things that I want to go over before we start. Um, now I'm going to go get ahead and get started with our session today and introduce to you our presenters. We have Greg Cummings, who's the Director of Solutions Consulting from VPI, and he's um, had a lot of experience in this area. You're going to love hearing from him. He's uh, led quality and performance management implementations at several different companies and been a Director of Operations at an Outsourcing Contact Center and Manager of Customer Support at Verizon. Welcome, Greg. And Patrick Botts, who's the, v the Vice President of Workforce Optimization for VPI. And he has 15 years of contact center management consulting and workforce optimization experience. He's definitely an acclaimed author and speaker. We love to hear Patrick on these web seminars. And he has an MBA from Pepperdine and a BSE from Arizona State. So I'm going to turn it over to Greg now and let everybody get started. And I hope you enjoy this web seminar. Okay, thank you so much, Vicki, and uh, to everyone who's joined us today, uh, thank you for attending and taking the time. We definitely do appreciate it and know your time is valuable, so thank you again for joining us. We're looking forward to an exciting session today. Uh, both of you will hear from myself and Patrick, and uh, really going to have some fun with this and uh, hopefully share a lot of good information with everyone who's joined us. So I'll just quickly take us through our agenda. And then we're going to dive right in. Uh, really, we're going to cover two core components today. Uh, one is really around quality assurance best practices. Uh, how do we select the right interactions? Uh, Analytics-driven QA and coaching to really find and start to understand and analyze the right types of calls. Uh, what are some of those best practices around calibration? Are we doing calibration? Are we doing it the right way? And are we measuring the right things? And then we're going to touch on QA form design and what are those, some of those best approaches and best practices we can implement in our organizations to really drive the most value from the quality management process. The second half of the webinar is really going to focus on workforce optimization best practices. Uh, and again, this is one of those hot items for everyone uh, these past few years, really understanding and driving towards what are those metrics that really matter, and are we, are we looking at the right metrics and KPIs? Uh, performance reporting best practices and really trying to understand the reports and the data analysis that we're doing. Are they driving our goals? Are they aligned with our corporate objectives? Right, so we're going to dig into that. Uh, accurately measuring FCR, right? FCR is one of those words we're probably hearing every day in the office, and we want to ensure that everyone has enough visibility and understanding around FCR, where we try to drive the impact, and really what that bottom line impact is on an organization. And then effectively transitioning to real-time reporting. It's another key component uh, in any contact or organization is understanding data in real time or near real time so we can make actionable, informed decisions, right? These are the core competencies we're going to focus on today, quality management, workforce optimization, and we're going to get right into it. So first thing we're going to go, uh, just a quick a little bit about VPI. We were founded over 20 years ago, and we've got a reputation for innovation and service excellence. We're headquartered in Southern California, so we definitely love the weather here. And we've got more than 1,000 customers globally in multiple verticals, uh, so we touch a wide range of organizations and really enjoy working with our customers and forming those long-term partnerships. Our solutions are essentially focused around contact center quality and workforce optimization. And as you can see in the ribbon down below, really all this ties together from desktop call and screen recording and other media capture, chat, email, etc. cetera, uh, quality management, speech and data analy analytics, workforce management, e-learning and coaching. As, as you can see, right, those lines are all kind of drawn into that central business intelligence bubble, right, which is really at the core. Uh, VPI does a great job of collecting data and then allowing organizations to make informed decisions on what they do with that information and how they work to improve process in the organization. So that's just a little bit about VPI, and again, we look forward to connecting with everyone uh, in the future. So thank you. 
This should look familiar to everyone. This is one of my favorite slides, and I get an opportunity to present this quite often with uh, Patrick and others in the organization. And this, I think, if everyone's out there kind of smiling, right, this might resonate with a lot of the folks on the phone today. Traditional quality monitoring oftentimes is looking for a needle in a haystack. So we want to help break down some of those barriers and get us away from that traditional quality monitoring kind of focus that's been so prevalent for so many years. The approach has been, right, where we are targeting these low value interactions with traditional quality monitoring and how do we kind of move away from that and start to target high value interactions, those needles in the haystack, and you're going to hear quite a bit today about how we go about facilitating the process, we can find that needle and start to do quality analysis on the calls that are of high value, the worst practices, the best practices, and really understand and give the appropriate feedback internally to the agents and also look to improve process. Oftentimes process management and process improvement is critical and when we're talking about the volume of calls an agent takes compared to what we QA, it's really important that we are targeting the right types of calls. So we want to break the mold of that traditional QA approach. We want to get away from kind of random monitoring and really start to look at those high value interactions and understand really where that, that determination is. So some of the top strategies to improve quality, and these are the next things we're going to go through. We're going to touch each of these components as we work through right, the top 10 best practices. Uh, how do you tie quality scores to training? Right? Use analytics to find higher, high value calls. Uh, automate the QA workflow. Right? Speed up QA feedback to agents. R ramp up our calibration sessions and use auto scoring via speech analytics. There's a lot of these core things and these are those top strategies and kind of how they rank. And this is really where we're going to drive into each of these components and really take it to the next level. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Patrick. You're going to hear from both of us kind of as we go through this today. But Patrick is going to take us through the next few slides and he's going to talk about best practice number one, two, and three, and then we're going to tr transition back. So Patrick, thank you so much uh, for being part of this and look forward to hearing you take us through the next few items. Great. Thanks, Greg. So uh, yeah, excited to share uh, uh, some best practices around analytics. So as Greg mentioned, you know, how do we get that needle in the haystack, right? And I think this picture sums it up well is, is analytics is kind of your magnet, if you will. It's going to help you uh, pinpoint and target uh, the calls or, or the interactions, it could be emails, chats, so forth, that you're looking to to evaluate. So you're not just kind of hunting, pecking for calls, right, which is what we do today. Um, so kind of the story that, that I like to tell is you come home, let's say you come home from your summer vacation and you have just this mailbox that's just packed right full. Or if you're, you're smart, you know, you have the... Um, the post office holds your mail and you come and they give you a huge box of mail, right? And it's like, where do we start, right? So if we think about what typically comes in the mail, uh, we have, you know, 90% is probably junk mail, uh, stuff we, we didn't even ask to receive, maybe, you know, catalogs, things like that, um, you know, personal things. Maybe some of the catalogs, you know, we're interested in actually reading, right? Uh, bills, right, are important to us, not, not necessarily things we always want to read, but, um, you know, financial statements, whatever it is, right, you may have some, some things that are valuable that you actually kind of want to filter out of the pack as quickly as possible. So if you think about analytics, you think of it as a, as a filter, if you will. So let's assume all these envelopes came in the mail. They were all blank. Nothing was written on them. Um, how would and that's kind of like right now, right? How, what, what, when our calls come in, we don't really have much data associated with those calls, right? When we're recording a call, it's maybe the the the, the time, the agent that took it, maybe we get some caller ID, just some typically some basic information, right? So call data, you know, it was this long, it's 11 minutes, you know, it was inbound, and agent Todd Smith took it. Well, that's great. So some of us, from a quality monitoring standpoint, when we're looking for calls, we, we say, ah, you know, we don't really want anything under three minutes or four minutes, right? So um, we can use that, that data a little bit, and we tend to do so. Um, but, you know, maybe your recording system, you know, when it's connected to your phone system, you're actually getting hold times and, and that the call was transferred. 
wow, well, this looks, you know, it's it's much more valuable now because the call that was transferred, you know, we do a lot of work with J.D. Power and Associates. It's, uh, I think, 10 to 12 percent uh, lower customer satisfaction on average um, if that call has been transferred, right? So that's right there. That's something that might be of interest to us, right? So we probably want to open this envelope. So let's take it a little bit further. Desktop data, right? Which is this? This is kind of the gem of the analytics. It's uh, we always rec- typically recommend desktop analytics, which is basically just a connector to your CRM system your claim system, your help desk system. So every time you're taking a, uh, a call, all this data is getting tagged to the call recording, right? So anything that shows up on the agent screen, whether it be the customer ID, you know, it's new product A, the product type, we know that it's a billing inquiry. We, we can tell that this customer called in again because we're capturing customer ID. It's their second billing inquiry today. Um, there's a six unsuccessful upsell. They went into an upsell screen and it didn't result in a sale. There's no value, a sale value captured. That is tremendously valuable information. So just imagine in your call recording system, you could search by all of this. Well, that's what desktop data analytics does. And oftentimes, uh, people tend to jump right to speech analytics and say, how, you know, we need speech analytics and speech analytics is tremendously valuable, but they forget that there's, that it's possible to tag all this data from your CRM applications or whatever servicing application you're using to the calls as well. And you can use that in your rules for quality monitoring, or you can search by those attributes as well. Um, it's it's also a lot more cost effective than speech analytics is. So, Speech analytics adds like the third dimension. So uh, the call data, the desktop t- data will tell you the what, what is happening, which is an unsuccessful upsell, upsell attempt. The speech and text analytics, you know, text if you're using chat, email, and social media, um, it's, it's a similar process. That actually, you know, analyzes the conversation, the, the, the words that were spoken or typed, um, and will tell you the why within that conversation. Why is this happening? And, and you can, you know, uh, look for things like, you know, in this case, this particular envelope, um, you know, there's an outrageous price increase. I want to speak with the manager. You don't even offer what Company Z does. Now you definitely want to open this envelope, right? I mean, all this stuff happened in this one interaction, right? So we have more information. The more the, I would, I, I would, data to to us is is really becoming the new oil, if you will. There's so much value and having this additional data kind of tagged to your recordings, if you will. So just to illustrate the desktop uh, data analytics, so you know, when I was saying, you know, you, you kind of just determine what fields in your CRM system, this is just a, you know, uh, a, a, this could be your CRM system, your help desk system. You know, uh, I had uh, one person come up to me recently and said, you know, we, we did the speech analytics rollout, we finally got some really great information I said, what What do you find? And, and they said, well, we actually, we, were, we launched this new product and we wanted to target and, and QA monitor calls related to the new product and see what customers were saying about the new product. And I said, well, does that product name show up in your CRM system? And they said, yeah, it, it does. And I said, well, with desktop analytics, you can get 100% of those calls tagged with that product name and you can find them all right away. And, it, and it's you know, it takes days to implement versus months. So just something to consider there. But it, as you can see, it all gets tagged to uh, the recording uh, down, and then that's searchable and can be used in QA rules. So you'll hear us use the term buckets, right? Uh, whatever type of analytics you use, you create these category buckets. And category, you know, once you have your calls automatically going into these buckets, then you can trend them over time. You can uh, send them off to QA, you know, for analysis. You can just listen to them if you want, which is what many do. So, you know, the the, the call data, three to five minutes, that's what we do now, right? Hey, we kind of hunt and pack, and we're looking for calls that fit the time frame that, that we're looking for, you know, that seems to be good fit for the type of calls we handle. 
you had desktop data, now you can add things that, you know, maybe we have a bucket called canceled accounts, and this month we're going to focus on QAing canceled accounts. Every agent's taking canceled accounts. We want to learn more on why customers are canceling. Or new orders, maybe we want to share the best practices of what the top reps are doing, um, you know, to, to get these high-value orders. And then speech analytics buckets, um, things like, Requested an escalation, negative sentiment, or customer dissatisfaction are buckets that we often create for our customers. Things like people are saying, hey, you people, or ridiculous. And there's an, a nice uh, um, study that was done by KPMG Insurance. They found that when the word ridiculous is used in the service interaction by either the agent or the customer, right? So typically, it, depending on your phone system, you have the ability to search on the customer or agent channel, uh, but in this case, it didn't even matter whether it was a customer or agent. Uh, customer is 80% uh, likely to change their insurer within three months. That's huge. What if you could find a large percentage of those calls where, where people were saying ridiculous and put a customer save team on them? And then competitive mentions are obviously very popular, uh, typically categories uh, that we like to create. Um, but the great thing is, is you can use data and speech to create buckets, right? So I want all canceled accounts where um, there's a competitive mention, right? Give me that. So there's a lot of value there. And this becomes the foundation for any type of analytics, whether you're using it for quality assurance, whether you're using it to predict customer churn, whether you're using it to, you know, to monitor for conformance uh, to things. So... Uh, tip number two is automating the QA workflow. So if we think about, you know, not only today typically we're hunting and pecking for calls, um, many of us, you know, 53%, this is a study from Vicky's group, Vicky's organization, Quality Assurance and Training Connection, um, you know, the, the majority of us are only doing one to five calls per agent per month, QAing, right? And if we're lucky, we're getting, you know, one or two that are actually coachable calls out of those one to five. So, um, you know, how do we uh, not only target, you know, higher value calls, right, find the needles in the haystack that we should really be listening to, but how do we evaluate more calls as well, right? Um, and, the, and there's um, some nice techniques uh, that I'll share with you here. The, the first one we recommend is, a to-do list. So it sounds simple, but it's basically having a business rule, schedule your calls for review. And it could still be completely random. Maybe it's just, you know, two calls per agent per month uh, assigned to the supervisor for review. Or, you know, if you have a QA team separate, five calls per agent per month assigned to, um, you know, the QA analyst responsible for that group. That alone, not having to go hunt and peck for calls, you'll double your productivity. I mean, it is unbelievable. That simple business rule, you know, and, and you know, you have to kind of look at your system, your quality system, your recording system. Can you just schedule the calls so people don't have to search for the calls and kind of randomly? It's not really that random if you're not, you know, scheduling them anyways, right? So we, we, we call it random monitoring, but often we're still kind of going in, hunting and pecking for calls. This makes it completely random, you know, um, or it can be targeted. In this case, we're sending, you know, we could send 100% of all upsell attempts where there's no sale. You could send 5% of all upsell attempts where there's no sale. Um, you know, so the rules you can kind of adjust any way um, that you see fit but you can focus on higher value calls, uh, and then it takes away um, that, hey, the com it's not me picking your bad calls, right? It's the, the system is going through and automatically picking the calls. So if you, you know, you, you look at, you can talk to the computer, if you will, right? <laughs> if you have any issues with that. But um, you may say, some people say, hey, well, if we're looking at upsell accounts where there's no sale, then we are looking at bad calls, right? Um, but in many cases, every agent has an upsell temp where there's no sale, so we're evaluating them all on that. If you like. So then, the this is kind of the the you know that that helps speed up the the quality assurance um, the workflow, if you will. 
then what we're seeing interest in is from a lot of our clients is, hey, we're interested in monitoring the conformance of, of 100% of our calls, right? So we kind of want to run all our calls through speech analytics and, and have speech score them. So this is our recommendation. So there's certain parts within a QA form. If you think about your questions, let's see whether you have 10 questions or 15, you could probably pull, you know, a good 50 to 80 percent of those questions out. And if they're things like, you know, proper greeting or, you know, maybe a call recording disclaimer that you had to say, verifying information, right? Um, verifying, you know, contract or policy terms or whatever it may be. Those are things that, that speech analytics, if you created a bucket, a category for each of those, you could run all, all, all your calls through that and have it tell you, you know, for this agent, what percentage of calls do you think um, the agent said um, that, that, that um, term or, or what they were supposed to be saying or that disclaimer. So this is a courtesy transfer Right, if you're supposed to, or this is a courtesy call, that's not the same as this call may be recorded uh, for quality assurance, right? So if that's not showing up, then you'll get a percentage. Again, speech analytics is not 100% accurate like data analytics, right? Um, it's going to give you a good estimate of where you need to focus on. So in this case, we're going to drill down and listen to, on this scorecard, we're going to listen to um, the call recording display disclaimer, you know, where, where, where speech analytics identified it, that, you know, only 55% of the time that's not happening, and then uh, verifying contract terms. And you think about it, it doesn't have to be 100% accurate. All I need is one or two examples of where the agent didn't do what they were supposed to be doing to coach on, right? So basically what you do is you create speech buckets for these types of things, and then we recommend still keeping a, a shortened quality assurance form for the softer type of skills um, that will still be evaluated, and, and the agent still gets a QA score from the QA form uh, on things like product knowledge or accuracy, accuracy um, active listening, things that may be a little bit tougher to do from a speech analytics standpoint. Um, we, so what we call this is a conformance monitoring scorecard. Um, we don't call it compliance monitoring. We don't call it script adherence monitoring um, because, again, speech is not 100% accurate, but it doesn't need to be. You just need one, two, three example calls where the agent's not doing what they should be doing. And, again, this is, this is just going in near real time, so you're not waiting till the end of the month till you know, QA evaluations are scored to coach the agent on these issues. You know, you're able to identify it, you know, 29 days ahead of, you know, when the agent might receive feedback in a typical QA environment. So um, if you have any questions, please put them in the question dialog box. We look forward to, to helping answer those. And then um, at this point, I'd like to transfer it back to Greg um, to, uh, to talk about uh, um, uh, speeding up QA feedback to agents, which a lot of organizations are also trying to do. Okay, thank you, Patrick. And that's great, right? The um, the tip number three you just shared there with the, the conformance and the scorecarding uh, using speech analytics, I think, is one of those critical components and really would encourage anyone to, to start investigating that further because it can really expand the breadth of the evaluations you're doing, help you to shorten and make your form a little bit more precise and garner just broader insights. So really great stuff that we're, we're pioneering there. Uh, all right, so tip number four, right? This is integral in any organization, right? We want to make sure that we can speed up the QA feedback to agents, and that's really critical. I worked in and work with contact centers uh, and have for a very long time, longer than I'd like to admit, and uh, understand that from an agent's perspective, oftentimes they don't get feedback in a timely manner, and it really can start to hinder their ability to continue to improve and progress uh, as an agent and enhance their skills and their abilities to, to provide that level of customer service that we're looking for right, with all of our agents, because that's the goal, right, to provide that top-notch customer service right, to be a world-class world -class organization. Uh, we want to display those QA scores in real time and any of the feedback that's going to help that agent continue to improve. Supervisors are busy when a QA evaluation is completed, maybe it's ready for review. If 
24, 48, 72 hours goes by, maybe a full week goes by because schedules and time off, before that supervisor gets an opportunity to sit down with the agent and review that, the agent probably forgot what that call was even about and maybe is not going to have as, as an engaged conversation as they could if that feedback was done a little sooner or if agents had direct access into their own evaluations that they could review that, right, make some notations, and then have an intelligent, informed conversation with their supervisor. That's much more of a sharing dialogue, not a here's what you did, let me point out the good and the bad, right? Let's have an open communication so when we talk about displaying QA scores and tickers and scorecards, uh, giving them their month to date, their year to date, uh, providing them right what the current you know customer service or the CSAT metrics are, and then also giving them direct access into their evaluations and working with workforce management to ensure that they have 15 minutes a day to maybe review any recently completed evaluations so they can start to make some mental notes, they can add their kind of sign-off process, and then have an informed discussion. It's all going to help reinforce that behavior that we want them engaged, right? We want to empower agents to be part of the process, right? And that's really what it's about, all about. The generation, right, today needs engagement. We need to have people informed. It all goes about data and information sharing. So those desktop tickers, wall boards, um, access to the calls, Right, is really critical um, up in until you get into your live coaching session. So that's a, a great tip there, one that you know I think we all understand, and maybe that's kind of we think, oh, we should be doing that. Are we doing that is kind of the question we want to ask ourselves. <clears throat> so the next one really is – uh, kind of built on top of this is tying quality scores to training. And this is, again, another critical component. Um, I, I did some training and development in my past life as well. And I think it's so important that training and development and quality management work together. Right? Those two organizations, in my opinion, should be joined at the hip. Right? What the quality team is doing with regards to coaching and process management and kind of giving feedback uh, should directly relate to what the training and development team is doing and right, increase evaluation and coaching frequency, allowing your agents to self-evaluate and then maybe give feedback to the quality monitoring team and also feedback to the training department say, when I'm listening to some of my calls and I'm seeing the way things are scored, if we would have done this a little bit differently in training, that would have been great. Right? So there's this definite link between quality and training. Uh, and allowing agents to flag calls, right? You can kind of see we've got the Olympics and the Oscar there on the right-hand side. Uh, this is a, a game that we like to kind of, you know, implement uh, with organizations when we do kind of some consulting engagements is really kind of, you know, kick off something like uh, the, the Summer Olympics or the Academy Awards and allow agents to flag a call that they thought they performed really well in. And then that's going to allow you to kind of have a little internal competition. It's fun. You make it exciting. And it's going to help you build a library of best practice calls that can be used in training. And you want to always praise those exemplary calls. You want to highlight that good behavior and reinforce right, those methodologies and that we're working towards to really improve that customer satisfaction. So those are some quick tips there that we can use to tie quality scores to training, and we definitely see a consistent increase in quality management scores across the agent base when we start to put these kinds of programs in place where we're making that direct link between quality and training. And that Summer Olympics is a lot of fun. Everyone really gets a good uh, gets behind that and uh, has, a, has a good time with it. So good to decorate with, right? Have people make those rings. Uh, definitely a program you can implement right very quickly and gain a lot of value from right out the gate. <clears throat> Continuing on that thread about tying quality scores to training, has anyone thought about creating a boot camp, right? Creating a QA form, right? in a boot camp mode, and this is one of these principles that I love to preach, it's when an agent comes out of training, they are in an incubation stage normally, and they're kind of getting their feet wet, they're off, off and running, and they've got this 60 to 90 day window where we really know that they're starting to ramp up. Now, one thing that's been very successful organizations that we've worked with is to create a form for maybe a 30 to 60 day period that's very subjective in nature and starts to build them up over time and increase their confidence, just like boot camp does, right? Anyone who's got a military background knows anything about boot camp, they break you down and then they build you up and they're building you up for a reason and there's a methodology behind the boot camp model is that they want to take you to a certain level and then they want to build upon that and turn you into something great, 
And when we start to build forms that are subjective in nature, right, excellent, good, getting better, needs a little improvement, right, we're not hammering an agent with a yes or a no or a pass or a fail, right? We want to be much more open and building during that short 30 to 60 day window before we transition to them into the non-subjective yes, no form, right? And that's going to help them make that smooth transition into QA into the standard process. So we've seen a lot of success with this. I have a lot of great feedback from uh, clients and other folks that we've, Patrick and I have worked with in the industry, right? That boot camp form, and again, it's something that you can easily implement in your existing environments. Take your existing form, and now you just have to modify the answer choices a little bit to say, right, what would constitute, right, getting better, good, excellent, needs improvement, right? A very short work effort to modify that form and create a boot camp program can, again, pay dividends in the long run. And it helps to wrap everything together, bring them out of training, ramp them up, and then now you've got a very productive agent. We're going to see a big right, um, increase in you know, your, your agent retention uh, because they're brought up in a gradual pace to really be effective for the organization. Great tool. Want to see you guys start using it. Another component here to tie quality scores to training, assign coaching based on QA scores. This is another critical component. How nice would it be if you could embed an action into your quality assurance form that automatically triggered a training exercise to be sent to an agent? Now think about that. That's kind of cool, right? If the agent was to answer a question a certain way, I'm strike that if a quality analyst was to answer a question a certain way, like they didn't follow the proper guidelines for call verification, could that automatically send a coaching activity to the agent and now they have to review that as part of their learning and development? Let's have that automatically trigger through the form and have it automatically be presented in the agent desktop ticker or within whatever UI interface that they're accessing. It's really critical that when you do those automated actions, right, the value there is that you're shortening the cycle by which you're delivering training material to an agent and you're directly tying it to a behavior that they're being graded on in their quality process. So look to do an injection of that quality and coaching together in your QA form and have it automatically trigger and send out, right? Anything we can do to shorten the cycle of feedback, coaching, and training to an agent, the better we're going to be in the long run because we know there's high production at the agent level and we want to keep this fresh in their mind at all times. All right, so best practice number six, ramp up those calibration sessions. Uh, the frequency of calibrations, right? This is a little chart that tells a, a, a nice little story. And again, this is from Vicki and the QATC team, um, a study that was done in 2014, right? Once a month, 34%, right? Once every two weeks, 25%. Don't calibrate once a quarter, once a week, right? Really, we want to see those calibration sessions continue to come on the rise. And the more you can do to automate that, because we want to hold our, our QA analysts accountable as well, and our supervisors and managers. When you can automatically assign them calls as part of a calibration process, you can start to move into that once a week mode because even though it is another review they have to do, it's really critical that we keep everyone in line and on the same page with how we're evaluating calls. Processes change all the time, and we need to make sure that we're always being kept up to date. Depending on the size of the organization, it's even more critical. Um, but when you start injecting calibration once a month, right, which is the highest number here, in a lot of cases is not enough. We really want to move it to at least once every two weeks or do your best to get it into a once a week routine. And as you start to do that, you're going to see, right, again, QA scores continue to rise. Your consistency across the board is going to continue to increase. And one more last thing I'll recommend here, involve an agent. Bring an agent in every other session. Get the floor involved because water cooler effect will start to immediately play in. They'll feel engaged, part of the process, part of the program, and that's going to spread throughout the organization. So uh, definitely, definitely recommend you bring agents or other people in the organization into those calibration sessions to be part of that process. Continuing on with that, on the ramping up of the calibrations, right, there's three critical factors for calibration success. 
well-vetted monitoring evaluation forms, right? quality standard definitions, and a commitment from the calibration team. And you've got to have a champion. We need to ensure that the form is well-built and everyone has signed off on it. The quality standards are clearly defined and everyone's got their book, right? They've got their little QA Bible that they, oh, I've got to flip through this and make sure I'm answering this question the right way. And that needs to have a constant review, right? Every quarter, be checking on that, making sure it's up to date. And then, obviously, a commitment from the calibration team. Um, it's got to be something that's bought in by everyone, all the way from upper management, all the way down. Right? That has to be a commitment within an organization. The monitoring form, right? State of the Union, QA scoring scheme. Uh, a lot of people do a score scale, right? A lot of people do yes, no, or pass fail. So we're going to touch on each of those points that I just talked about previously. Uh, and then there's kind of that other category. And then there's objective on the QA form, right? mostly subjective, somewhat, right, about half and half, completely objective, right? These are those kind of two methodologies that are currently, right, kind of in place. Uh, and take a look and where do you guys fall? Where do you lie with regards to, right, your monitoring evaluation forms, right? And you can kind of see where the industry lies. And again, this is from another study by the QATC for best practices, right, in 2014. Um, and where do you fit into that role? And some of the best practices, right, ideally questions should be linear, right, yes, no, or not applicable. If you're using variable rating scales, define each grade in writing. It's really important if you're going to kind of deviate from a yes, no, right, we want to make sure that we're defining each of those uh, in, in a clearly in writing definition. Everyone's got that shared. Uh, train all on predefined scoring benchmarks, right? Training is critical for how the process is. I always like to bring a QA analyst into training and have them walk through the process with new hires and constantly do checkpoints to make sure we break down any, any, any mystery around the QA department, right? It should be a very open, communicative process flow where everyone is understanding what's exactly going on and understand what goes into building the form and doing the monitoring. Uh, it should reflect what is important to the company and the customers. That's critical. It should align the goals and objectives of an organization along with the key objectives of what we're trying to accomplish for our customers. We want to organize questions in a flow of a call, right? It's very common. I think a lot of us do that now. The call flows a certain way. We know that. It's very predictable in most cases. And we want to have our form flow the same way. And then weight more critical questions heavier. Add a weight multiplier. Make them worth more points because you want that to have more of an impact if they were to miss a particular area. And then you want to keep the sh forms short and targeted, right? That's really what's key. Um, having a form that's maybe two or three categories and maybe five or six questions each category can really go a long way uh, instead of having seven, eight, nine pages or categories and then you know, ten questions. Um, short, precise, to the point, and targeted is going to go a long way with helping improve efficiency, productivity, and also with the data retention when you're reviewing this. If you uh, it's too much to consume right, for an agent, it, some of it's going to get lost in translation, and we want to keep it targeted. Quality standards definition. This is, again, one of those things I think everyone on the phone who's got exposure to quality management, right, and that's why we're here, is uh, probably looking at this and saying, I've got one of those. I have one of those guides. Uh, yes, we all do, right? We want to outline those requirements for each question, providing examples of behaviors for each scoring range. Uh, if it's an auto-fail, and what deems it as an auto-fail, right, you want to have this clearly laid out. And again, this, could be, this should be something that's shared Internally, it shouldn't be a secret, right? Everyone should have a copy of this. Agents should have a copy of this on their desk so they know what they're being measured against and what those checkpoints are that's going to determine if they either achieved the behavior or did not achieve the behavior. So got to have a well-vetted quality standard definition document. And then the commitment to a calibration process and an owner, right? I like to put a gold star on top of that owner right there. Got to have an owner. Got to have a champion. Uh, you want to do it weekly until calibrate, and then you can move right to, to kind of you know every other month or monthly if you don't have the time. Um, you want to schedule the calibration calls, right? Evaluators evaluate calls independently, right? This is our process flow. The calibration owner analyzes the results, calculates your standard deviation, and then there's a group discussion where you analyze, right? Kind of review, talk about the results, uh, and then consensus score or reevaluate, and then start the cycle again. 
Uh, it's really important, right, that you want to stay um, within, you know, underneath, under five points for your standard deviation. You want to keep everyone in line. And really with a lot of calibration, it's critical to get down to the per question level and really start to do your calibration analysis review at the per question level. You're going to uncover a lot of process uh, improvements and you're going to un under, uncover where your gaps are potentially within the, within the team or the organization. So commitment to calibration and assign an owner. Can't put enough emphasis on that. Got to have a champion. Okay, so now we're going to transition a little bit. Let's kind of, you know, shake that out a little because we talked a lot about uh, quality management. We're going to move right into workforce optimization best practices. So a recent Gartner study talked about what contact centers want today. They want real-time and predictive data. We want unified views instead of fragmented views from siloed systems. And we want, in addition to reporting, right, insights that are actionable and help me drive and make better decisions. So commonly what the challenge is, and again, I'm in California, so this resonates well with me. We've got a lot of earthquakes out here. Uh, the challenge commonly, right, and you can see it here at the silo, are we've got different disparate sources. We've got communication systems. We've got workforce optimization systems. We've got servicing apps. But how do we bridge this? How do we bring this together and create unified views of data that allow us to consume it in a meaningful way? Right? And that's where we're really kind of breaking down that barrier. And the solution is business intelligence. This is something that, again, has been very hot the last few years and is gaining more and more momentum. Um, to consolidate and operationalize this data really starts to paint a better picture when you can bring in your ACD, your email, your chat, your QA, kind of all that into a centralized platform. You're going to gain a better picture as to what's happening in the contact center and be able to drive and make better business decisions. So that's really critical. Consolidate that data, bring it all together. And then as part of that, right, that next kind of key tip here is to create weighted KPIs and targets. You can kind of see by looking at this hierarchy model down at the bottom, uh, when we're creating a productivity metric for agents, right, it really is a culmination of several things. Down at the bottom, we've got tier three just core metrics, right, talk time, after call, sign on hours, non-contact work. And then you tier that up and you create a tier two metric like handle time. So handle time is, right, Talk time plus your after calls divided by your total calls is going to give you a handle time. You've got availability, and then you wrap in schedule adherence. You bring those together, right, and you pick out and you get a KPI of adjusted calls per hour. So the ability to create and define uh, weighted metrics and being able to build those what we would call a true KPI is critical. If you're not doing this right now in the organization, there's a lot of great resources out there that can help you to further understand what these definitions are, how you should build these. Right? And again, we're consuming data here from multiple sources, and we need to be able to have that data in a centralized system to be able to create those KPIs and really give a good metric out to an agent, which is what is that productivity value? How are we measuring it? Another example of a way to KPI, right, overall performance, right? So we've got our, our metrics, right, schedule adherence, right, quality assurance, customer sat, sales conversions, attendance, all that rolls up to overall performance. And again, we're just taking multiple metrics and creating an overall value and then being able to rank them based on how that overall performance is, is going. So measure KPIs also, uh, this is another great tip. So tip number eight here, uh, measure KPIs on an interval basis. This is one of those one that's a little deceiving. I think if you kind of look at this, we're going to break this down. Service level is a percent of net offered calls right, that were answered in X seconds or less. On average, we look at service level, it's up on a wall board, it's in big bright red, we're at 95% service level, 90% service level. We're looking good, maybe we're at 80, we're at our goal. But does that tell the whole story? Right? Not necessarily. When I break this down, when we start to look at service level on an interval basis, it starts to point out some things we might need to do to make some adjustments. So when we like to look at service level, I recommend you take it down to that granular half hour or hour interval. And as an example, you can see here on the right-hand side, there's a few areas during the day where we were below or well below our service level objective of 80%. Now, on the top level, my daily average is 82%. I look good. But what happened during the day here between 10 and noon, I was below. And then in the afternoon, I had another dip. Even though, because my 100% in the morning helped to offset my daily average, and again, that's going to be a little deceiving. So we want to make some schedule adjustments. But the way we do that 
and to find that understanding is to look at service level at a bit more of a granular level and understand it at the interval basis. And that's really key. And you can do that with a lot of your metrics, with your abandonment rates, with your talk times, your handle times, um, a lot of different KPIs you can take down to that interval view and then start to get a better picture right, than just looking at how do we do for the day because sometimes that can be a little deceiving. So definitely recommend measure KPIs on an interval basis whenever possible and when it makes sense. Here's another core example, right? This just kind of elaborates on what I was just talking about. We've just got the components highlighted here, and you can see kind of how the trend line moves. Only five of the intervals within 75% to 85% range goal. Okay, so with that, I'm going to transition it back to Patrick. He's going to take us through the last two points, points number nine and 10, and then we're going to open it up and uh, do a little bit of Q&A. So Patrick, I'm going to hand the ball back to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Greg. So uh, FCR is hot, right? So we know that um, just based on, on research that FCR, every 1% gain in first contact resolution uh, typically results uh, in a 1% gain in customer satisfaction. Um, so if you think about, and, and some of you may know this, what is a 1% increase in CSAT or net promoter score? What does that look like in terms of uh, overall impact to your organization, overall revenue? It's It's probably very substantial. So from a contact center standpoint, um, not only does FCR cost us a lot, if you look at the, the point at the bottom here, 66% of contact center costs today are due to callbacks. That's huge, right? And, and yeah, we can't solve every issue in the first contact, but if we can make a dent in FCR, uh, we can have huge impact not only on, um, on costs, but also on uh, revenues as well. Uh, in terms of uh, CSAT and loyalty. So uh, how, do, how do we measure FCR today, right? So there's a lot of ways organizations are doing so. Um, you know, you see, if you look kind of call quality monitoring, which we talked a lot about today, 20% of organizations are, are measuring FCR that way, right? So they put a question on the QA form and they, and they say, um, you know, has did the was this was this call resolved in the first call, and um, you know surveys. So there's different surveys: annual surveys, post call surveys, recent contact surveys. So if you look at it, you know over 50% is done through some sort of question, right? Whether it be you know on the quality monitoring form or on a survey. Um, the challenge with that is, let's say I get my bill in the mail. Going back to kind of the mail example, I get my bill in the mail. Um, I have, you know, an issue with something on the bill. It could be something with the address is wrong or something else on the bill is wrong. Um, I call in, right? I, 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 tell, I tell you that, um, you know, there's an issue. Um, you, re you know, you resolve it. I think it's resolved. Everyone thinks it's resolved. Um, and on the QM form, it gets marked as resolved. On the post-call survey, the IVR, I say, yep, it was resolved. Great, thanks. Well, then I get my bill in the mail, right, 30 days later, and it's still wrong. So it really wasn't resolved, so I call back in again, right? So the only way to capture that is to do uh, typically a calculation from the CRM system information or, or the customer system information to say, if I call and you set a time frame in a billing issue case, it would be 45 days, and you say, if I call again, regarding a billing issue within 45 days, then I want to mark that as, as a repeat call, and we want someone to evaluate it, right? So in order to catch those things, and each call type typically, typically has a certain number of days that you want to allot for kind of looking. Some, some call types may be a week, some may be 24 hours, some may be, you know, 90 days. It just depends on the call type. But really, that's kind of where you want to get to is tracking it with customer data. Did this customer call again for the same reason? And the reason can come um, you know, from different places. So these are the three things we typically need to more accurately calculate first contact resolution. Who's the customer? That could be coming from your IVR or you know the call ID or the CRM system. Why are they contacting you? So again, it could be from the IVR, press one for this, two for that. Um, it could be I have a case number assigned to me or a ticket ID. 
that's ideal because then we can just follow that case number, that ID throughout the process. Um, you might have reason or disposition codes entered um, into your CRM system, which really helps as well. Uh, and then the time period, like I mentioned, each call or each type of interaction should typically have a different time period um, associated with it where it makes sense. Do we want to flag this call if they called in the same day? Uh, maybe not, right? Maybe we give them uh, a week. All right, so now getting into kind of real-time reporting, right? So this last tip has to do with the dissatisfaction associated with our reporting today, right? So um, the time to gather and share metrics, uh, over 50% are, you know, dissatisfied essentially. And that's just because, as Greg mentioned, there's so many different siloed systems. So real time is where we're going. It's kind of where the industry is taking us, where the technology is taking us. But you really want to step back and assess your call, your call to's readiness for real time. And I put together this speedometer. So kind of the faster you turn this dial, the more impact you're going to have in terms of results. But you want to kind of look. So if you start showing group level metrics, which many of us do, on wall boards, things like that. Those are typically group stats. How is this group doing versus this group, this shift versus this shift? Um, you'll start to see some kind of improvement, right? The people feel empowered. They get to see um, how they're doing versus other groups. Some little bit of competition starts. You start showing agent versus goals. All right, hey, here's your goal. You know, we have goals for these KPIs, whether it's, you know, the typically between five and eight metrics and agents typically measured on the fewer, in my opinion, the better, but um, you have showing them where they're at versus their goal in real time, you'll start to see even more of an improvement. Then you, sh you could show agents versus group, right? That kind of takes it to the next level. You're saying, here's where everyone in your group is doing versus how we're doing. And then the real major impact that we're seeing is huge improvements in not only service but sales, collections, is Agent versus agent. This is literally the ranking Greg was talking about. And if you think about what motivates many people today, it's not the you know the nice house with the nice car and the white picket fence anymore. It's like the flexibility of the work shift. So if you do um, uh, performance-based shift bidding and, and agents know where they rank in real time on you know how they're going to what shift they're going to you know their their shift preference or their shift bid. It is huge. It's many times more valuable uh, than even any kind of gift cards or salary or anything you could provide. Just having that flexibility to, to be able to, to choose the shift they want to fit their lifestyle is, is very, um, is, is a key driver. I know it is for myself and, and our family and, and many of the people that I work with as well. So this is something that you know, showing agents where they rank in real time versus other agents um, is kind of where we're heading. Again, you don't always have to show them, you know, the you can mask the IDs. Some companies mask the IDs and things like that, so they're not showing the actual um, names, but they typically figure out who's at the top. Uh, ticker, so um, is one way. Agents typically will get a ticker. You saw the QA scores early in the ticker. This is a great tool. It's always on always in front of them so they get to see how they're doing, you know, versus their group or versus their goal, whatever you want to present. You could drag and drop the metrics in. They turn red and green based on how things are going. And this really helps, you know, if the queue is getting higher, agents will help each other out. Um, you can send messages saying, you know, if they're not in the, in, in, if they're in a, a state they're not supposed to be in for too long, um, you can send a, um, a message there. We saw one client, you know, improved, availability by 7% within just a week just by sending that little reminder, hey, you're supposed to be in this state and, and ready to take calls. So a lot of value with the ticker. From an executive perspective, um, more of a dashboard type of view. Managers and executives like to see the same data but more in a graphical view. Again, you can pull in information from all kinds of sources. But you need to define you know, what data – where do, where do you need to pull this information from? You may be fine just starting out with, we have many clients that say, hey, we want phone system metrics, service levels, calls in queue, wrap time, things like that. 
that's that's a great starting place. Then you can start pulling in QA scores, and you can start pulling in CRM system information like sales or maybe collection system information, uh, and then kind of pull it all together and build your dream dashboard. So what are the KPIs impacted most by real time, and why why is, are so many organizations going to real time? And it's these this is what you know you show adherence in that ticker. I mean, a 5% improvement in adherence, if you have 100 agents, that's like adding five more agents without hiring a single person. That's huge, right? So uh, handle time, usually about 10% decrease in handle time. Uh, wrap time even more, it's usually about a 25% decrease uh, in wrap time where agents tend to hide out. Uh, you know, um, So it's, uh, it's one of those things. You show them that, all of a sudden they start wrapping up the calls a little bit quicker. Um, again, Agents help each other out, so speed of answers, um, typically quicker and less abandoned calls. And then just think, like from a competitive standpoint, if you know how you're doing versus your group or your goal, that that competitive nature in sales and collections agent, it's just it's a it's a, a great thing to see. It's this healthy competition that builds, and so you see this boost really quickly. Typically within 30 to 60 days, sometimes even within a week of the tickers being up. And once they're up, you can't take them down. They're, they they like want them so bad. So uh, highly uh, recommend uh, thinking about using some sort of ticker like that. Uh, at this point, I know we're at the top of the hour, but if you do have a few more minutes, we'd love to uh, uh, you know answer some of the great many great questions that have come in. If we can't get to all of them, we'll answer them uh, on a one on one on a on a. Um, a private basis afterwards, but um, some great questions. Uh, I'll open it up now. And uh, we had here's question one here. We have a, a multi client contact center. Greg, I'll pose this to you uh, with varied products and services. Are most centers creating a quality form for each client or one form by client type, type of client or industry breaking out special requirements? All of our agents take calls for all clients. Thanks. That's a great question. Uh, and I, I think I would approach this two ways. <clears throat> I think I would definitely have an individual form for each client. That's the way you're going to be able to keep it constrained and kind of precise. So it's not a long form where you're doing a lot of not applicables or whole pages where you're not putting attention or focus on. Uh, definitely look at doing it on an individual client basis and keep those forms targeted and precise. And then alternatively, I would have one form that's just very um, non-client specific where you're focusing on soft skills, you're so focusing on you know, process adherence that are, that are just kind of the general processes. Uh, so you could actually attack this two ways. Have that general form, but also have a client-based form, and then set your objectives and goals that you, from most, most of your evaluations are done on the client-specific form, but then there's two or three evaluations done per month that are done on the more general form, and start to do with some comparing and contrasting. So I would, I would just t attack that on both fronts. Um, and definitely look to, to create that client-based form as well, especially if you have to do any reporting back to your clients. If they have any SLAs in place with you or you need to provide them some reporting analysis, you're going to want to be able to have that data. It's going to be much easier to mine that data out of the uh, reporting when it is form-specific. So great question. Great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, I'll take this question. It's regarding uh, analytics, using analytics to find higher value calls. Um, so, um, the question is around um, what are some examples of the value of finding higher, some practical real life examples of finding higher value calls? And so, you know, Greg showed that kind of the, the bell curve, if you will. So, you have like the two sides that we've seen is you, you try to target the, the, the really good calls, right? The high value sales, um, and you're looking for calls. Uh, so one example I can think of is a mortgage company where they looked at uh, what were the characteristics, what types of tactics were agents using um, that were successful in closing um, uh, sales. So, you know, there was like 27 different tactics being used by the agents, and they found that there's really three that really worked consistently over, you know, uh, that the top agents were using. 
And so they once they found that out, right? They 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 listened and evaluated the the, the closed sales. Every every agent was closing sales, but they found out that these three things were just showing up over and over on the top sales. And they used that and trained all the agents on those three things. And within a few months, it was a two million dollar boost in sales. So that's kind of looking for on the on the good side, you know, the the best practice type of calls that you want to train and get other uh, reps on. And we see that a lot, even in speech analytics projects. You know, looking for what are the things that are really working, and let's get everyone else trained on that. And then on the other side is kind of the 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 problem calls, if you will. So um, some examples of that are you know, um, litigious statements being made. I can think of a, um, a, uh, a university that was, you know, their agents were guaranteeing things, right, during the enrollment process, and, and they're not allowed to be guaranteeing things. So that, that right there, you know, they pulled those agents off the floor right away, um, you know, and, and had to do some, some training around that. You, you can't do that. That could, you know, get them into a lot of trouble. Unprofessional language, um, you know, improperly commenting on customers' bad, bad credit scores, things like that. Those are things you want to identify really quickly. If you're just randomly listening to calls, you, you may find one or two instances of that, but you're not going to really target and find um, a lot of that. Another one we talked about, point nine here, is first contact resolution. Repeat calls. Why not flag all repeat calls and send them to QA, right? If you think about it, Every agent's taking repeat calls. A lot of it's out of their control, right? It may not even be an agent issue. It may be something in shipping or supply or some, some sort of process that's off. Add one more question to your QA form that's not even related to the agent. Why was this a repeat call? What was the issue? All of a sudden, you're, you're scoring repeat calls. You know, agents are still getting their QA scores. You're still coaching to, to the regular thing. But now you're actually gathering additional data about why this ended up and why this was a repeat call. And now you can trend and figure out what the core reasons are. You're not going to get that data if you're just kind of randomly monitoring. Uh, but if you had one more question to the QA form, um, you know, was it a billing issue? Was it a shipping issue? Was it an internal process? What was it? Um, you get some nice data that you can just, doesn't take much more effort to do that to add another question to the form. Well, Patrick, I hate to, to, to end this, but um, it, it looks like our time is up, and um, we, we've got another one coming up in just a, just a few minutes. So I really appreciate this. I think everybody got great information out of it. I do want to tell everybody, go out to the exhibit hall, go to the VPI booth, and um, get, the, get registered for their $100 Amex gift card. Had several more questions about getting the slide deck. It is on the agenda at ecrmevents.com. You do have to log in to see it. So if you log in in the top right-hand corner with your email address that you registered for the conference with, you can go to the agenda and you'll find the actual slides that we've seen today. Plus tomorrow, 24 hours later, you'll be able to see the recording. And that should be true for all of the sessions that throughout the week. So I appreciate all Patrick and Greg did showing you all this great information. And if you have other questions, follow up with them. But right now we are going to close this, and um, we will see you in shortly for our next web seminar. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Vicki. We'll also email these slides and the uh, recorded webinar to you as well as soon as it's available. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.